Hi, I'm Ben. I work at SAMP. I'm going to be talking to you about analyzing video metrics uh, like Richard Feynman. Say, so, why would you want to do that? Who is Richard Feynman? And why would you want to model your uh, video metric analysis after him? All right. So let me start off by answering that question of who he was. He was, of course, an uh, amateur bongo drum player. Right? But not just that, of course. Not just that. He was also a published artist. Um, and beyond that, he was also just an all-around eccentric kind of character who viewed life with a great sense of curiosity and often a bit of luck. And maybe it was for those attributes uh, that he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965 and was also a professor at Caltech for 40 years and considered one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. Uh, so now I've got bad guy to try to model uh, the way we look at uh, video metrics after. And he had this fantastic ability uh, to analyze problems and solve uh, these complex physics problems that were baffling even some of the uh, greatest physicists of the day. So maybe we can take some of the ways that he did that and try to apply it to our more mortal uh, analysis of video metrics. So how, where do we start from there? Well, he had a colleague named Murray Gelman, who also won a Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, who after years of working with Feynman, described something called the Feynman algorithm. Uh, and this is how he said Feynman solved these very complex problems in quantum electrodynamics. Okay, and so the Feynman algorithm is something like this. Step one, write down the problem. Okay, great. Step two, all right, this is a very important step. Think real hard, all right? And step three, the most critical step, is to write down the solution. Right. This is a highly effective algorithm, okay? But it has a problem, which is it has a dependency of being Richard Feynman. So what else can we use? Well, Feynman often said that in approaching a problem, he said the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. You might think, okay, you know, I know I have my personal biases, but when it comes to quantitative information, when it comes to data, objective truths, you know, I, I don't think I'm that easy a fool. Well, let me tell you about one of my favorite studies called Motivated Numeracy and Enlightened Self-Government. <clears throat> it was a 2013 study that came out, uh, and these scientists got a group of people, and they measured two things, okay? They measured, one, their quantitative skill, and they measured, two, their political affiliation, okay? And then they gave them a fake study to analyze, right? And say, all right, imagine there's this group of people, and they all have rashes. Put them into two groups, give one of those groups skin cream, um, and some of the people, rashes got better and worse, right? And they said, here are the results. Okay, does the skin cream improve uh, rashes or, or not, right? And there's a little bit of a trick here. Everyone here in, in this room could figure it out, after, um, which is initially it looks like the skin cream helps uh, the rash get better, but you see that there's a population difference, so it's a different rate, uh, so that the skin cream does worse, right? And predictably, uh, the higher they scored on their numeracy scale, the more likely they were to get to accurately interpret uh, their results, right? And that doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican. But no one really has a strong opinion about skin cream. So what if you change it to something else? What if you change the results to something like gun control, right? And about the results of, on crime if you ban guns in a community. And something fantastic happens, which is, no matter what their quantitative skill, if it doesn't align with what their political ideology is, people are unable to recognize the results uh, that are given to them. And notice there's even a, a, a slight decrease in the middle there, right? So there's two... Uh, fantastic results from insights from the study, which is that one, personal bias neutralizes quantitative ability, and people with higher quantitative ability perform worse since they're able to justify bias interpretations more easily. So, you're not immune uh, from fooling yourself. Um, imagine, for example, you know, obviously, you're probably not working on a hot topic like gun control, but you have bias when it comes to your feature or your product that you've been working on for months. Um, and so you have to be very constant and self-aware. Uh, so how do you, how do, you do that? Um, well, one question you should ask is, do you understand the nature of your metrics? Right? Feynman often told a story uh, about walking through the woods as a child with his father. He said that he'd, he walked through the woods and his father would point out a bird and say, that bird is called a brown-throated thrush. In Chinese, it's called a chanel. In, French is called a uh, lasso, and you can know all the names in the world for that bird, and you'll still know nothing about that bird. The only thing you'll know is about people, and what uh, people call the bird. Uh, and oftentimes, we kind of view uh, metrics like that. We know the names of these. We know the things that we're supposed to know. Oh, this is the mean. This is the sample variance. Uh, these are the correlations, right? But does that actually give us insight into the nature of what we're looking at, right? This is the famous Anselm's Quartet. They all have the same mean, variance, sample variance. 
uh, the summary statistics you see above. Um, and, uh, but you can see that the, the nature of what the actual underlying phenomenon is, uh, is very different, right? So trying to take a deeper look at that, let's say that you're looking at a graph of startup uh, latency, well, that is, and this is your data, right? And uh, it's actually pretty nice data. It's, it's, it's a Gaussian distribution. It means around 2.5, about standard deviation of one. And you want to say, okay, is this? How do I know when my latency is significant or not, right? And a lot of times, the first step is like, okay, I'll, I'll find the p-value, right? Well, okay, what happens when you do that? When you use a two or three sigma uh, p-value, you draw confidence intervals, right? So if you use three sigma, you see, well, what happens here? Low confidence interval is below zero, which doesn't make sense. Right? So what do you do then? Does that mean you have to use sigma two to draw your confidence intervals? Um, no. Uh, you know, this is, all this is is a statistical process, which means you can use a process sigma. You can use uh, sigma 1.5 or 1.7, depending on uh, the nature of what your product is, how your users react. Um, and so you're not limited to 95% confidence or 99% confidence, right? Um, you can choose something that makes more sense. So let's say you use a process sigma, uh, and, and you bring down the confidence intervals into something that looks a bit more relevant. Uh, OK, at this point, does it make sense to do statistical tests? Uh, well, maybe, but uh, look what's hap uh, also happening here. This is clearly a mean shift happening twice, right? First down and then back up, um, which means there's common versus special cause variation happening. And if you're doing something like alerting or anomaly detection, what you really care about is special cause variation, right? So you might want to draw boundaries now at the mean shifts of your common cause variation, so which looks something like this, right? And so this takes a, 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 a quite a bit of investigation, um, but it's something you need to do, especially if you have cycle, uh, cycles in a lot of your data. Uh, so after this, you're like, all right, done all this work, can I do some statistical tests now, right? But the thing is, p-values and statistical tests, they make a lot of assumptions. Um, so you have to ask yourself whether or not your data actually meets those assumptions. For example, is this auto-correlated, right? It's a time series, it probably is auto-correlated. And so, and this definitely is. Uh, and if there's auto-correlation, uh, that means you have to make adjustments to your statistical test. You can't, even though this is a nice Gaussian distribution, you can't run a t-test um, and assume that the results are valid uh, if you don't do that adjustment. So you say, okay, you want to understand the nature of metrics, but it's also very difficult, right? So the whole point of having this community is that we get to ask each other, like, what do other people think, right? Well, so what might Feynman say to that? Well, you might say, what do you care what other people think? In fact, that's the title of one of his books. Now, I don't think that he was talking about video metrics when he wrote the book, but the point is still valid, where she says, doubting the great Descartes was a reaction that I learned from my father. Have no respect whatsoever for authority. Forget who said it, and instead, look what they start with, where they end up, and ask yourself, is it reasonable? For example, 2012, Akamai had this study that said viewers will start abandoning a video if a startup takes longer than two seconds to begin playing, and every additional second of delay, another 6% of the audience leaves, right? Now, it's a really nice numbers, um, and it, it might be uh, easy to just take these numbers and say, okay, I can buy some of the research, I can apply it to my user group. Now, I'm not saying the, the research, there was anything wrong with the research that Agamai did, uh, but it just might not apply to you. In fact, it probably no longer applies to most people, uh, given uh, the date of the study either. We look at SNAP data. This is the abandonment curve uh, for SNAP. This is where two seconds is. Now, a few reactions here. One, teenagers are very impatient. <laughs> Two, Akamai's study uh, clearly wouldn't work for us, right? So uh, how else can we look at it, uh, this data? Well, one of the things that's pretty common, I like distributions, uh, density distributions like this, but uh, it's hard to communicate, right? Um, you can't um, really put in an email easily unless you, you, you know, pass around the visualization. Uh, and so a lot of times people use quantiles, uh, like measuring the P50 or P90. Uh, so you know, let's graph quantiles. Um, and uh, I don't actually think that shows up. Whoops. So uh, uh, the different quantiles here are plotted, and I have error bars, but I don't think you can see them, around the P90 uh, and P50. And they grow as uh, your, your quantile grows, right? Because as you go to a tail end distribution, your variability increases, which, is, which means the uncertainty in which you're saying, uh, reporting a P50 or P90 changes as well, 
right? A lot of times people just report P50 and P90 numbers as if they are reporting it with the same level of certainty, uh, but they're not. They're, there's a lot more uncertainty when it comes to reporting a P90 figure, right? Well, you might say like, okay, well, it's that uncertainty really matter that much. After all, it's only 10% of the views. Um, and that might be true, but 10% of views is not the same as 10% of viewers. Uh, looking at a week of snap data, uh, we found that 44% of viewers experienced a P90 stall duration over a one week period. Uh, and so this is a pretty significant amount of viewers. Uh, and too often we look at these view events independently, but uh, they're not independent because your users have a single relationship with your brand and your product. Uh, which means the view events have correlation with each other. Uh, so uh, I'll just say this is a lot of work to do in or, as part of analysis uh, of view, view metrics. And what if you're not Richard Feynman, right? Uh, what if you're just not very good at analytics? Um, how would you approach this uh, intractable problem, a, a difficult problem with a lot of uncertainty? Uh, so then I want, at the end, I want to talk um, about a story that Feynman uh, often related about his time at Los Alamos uh, Laboratory when he worked on the Manhattan Project, um, developing the nuclear bomb. And one day he went to a chemical plant where they were refining uranium. Um, and on the first day, this is what he said happened. Right? He, he went up to a table and two engineers uh, came up to him and laid down a bunch of blueprints. Uh, and he said they started explaining it. Right? They said the, the carbon tetrachloride comes in from here, uh, the ura uranium nitrate comes in from here, up through here, uh, up through a floor, up through a place, up through a second floor. Uh, it, it comes blurp, up through the, the stock of blueprints, down, up, down, up, talking very, very fast, explaining the very, very complicated chemical plan. So I was completely dazed. Worse, I didn't know what the symbols on the blueprint meant. There was this one symbol, I think it was a window. Uh, it was a little square with a cross in the middle. Uh, and it was all over the damn place. I think it's a window, but no, it can't be a window because it wasn't always at the edge. I want to ask them what it is. You must have been in this situation before uh, in which you didn't ask right away. Right away, it would have been okay. But they've been talking a bit too long. You hesitated too long. Now, if you ask them, they're going to say, what are you wasting all my damn time for? So I didn't know what to do. So, oh, he thought, what am I going to do? I had an idea. Maybe it's a valve. So to try to figure out if it's a valve or not, I put my finger down on the mysterious little crosses in the middle of the blueprint on page number three, and I said, what happens if this valve here gets stuck? Expecting that they're going to say, that's not a valve, that's a window. <laughs> so the engineer looks at uh, where I was pointing, and he says, ah, well, if that valve gets stuck, and he looks up and down on the blueprint and turns to the other engineer. He looks up and down, back and forth, back and forth. And suddenly they turn and talk to each other. And they turn and go. And they say to me with their mouths open like astonished fish, you're absolutely right, sir. <laughs> and they roll up the blueprint and they walk away. <laughs> so what do you do when you're approaching a problem with uncertainty? You try to better find out whether it's a valve or not. In other words, have curiosity and a bit of luck. Thank you.